one by one, they jumped over the fence. One, two, three. Oh, hello. Robert England here. Just, uh, just reading a bedtime story to some of my friends here on the crew. <laughs> We're all, uh, gathered here today for a special look back at the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, but there's really no reason for them to stay awake for it, <laughs> is there? <laughs> or you. So why don't you, uh, kick your shoes off? Lie back. Have a nice glass of warm milk. Mmm. Mmm. Feel free to drift off any time. I mean, after all, what's the worst thing that can happen if you fall asleep, huh? <laughs> I keep asking myself, was there something I could have done? Oh, but he seems so alive. He always, he always took such good care of himself. Well, the face, obviously, needed a little work, but now, now he's gone. So, how do we eulogize the dear departed? What can we say about Freddy Krueger, R.I.P.? Mm -hmm. He was a great movie monster, I guess, like Frankenstein or Dracula, but he was more than that. In the seven short years of his life, he became a worldwide phenomenon. From China to Sweden to Japan to the Wall Street Journal, he was written about and analyzed, psychoanalyzed with a scrutiny usually reserved for presidential candidates. He inspired songs, dances, cartoons, talk show jokes, six movies, a TV series, and at least one music video. So my advice to you is to stay ready, because you know who's back. Freddy. And then, of course, there's the money. At last count, the total cash earnings from the Freddy phenomenon, and by that I mean ticket sales, video sales and rentals, and merchandising around the world, it was roughly $500 million. You might call it a rags to riches story. You might say only in America. I'd say it, uh, it couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Wanna suck the face? No. <laughs> The whole idea of a nightmare on Elm Street and Freddy Krueger has literally infused itself into the uh, into the American culture, and uh, I guess there were, th th this was a, and is a day and age when there's lots of real nightmares around. But why did it happen? I mean, how do you explain it? How did an obnoxious, disgusting mass murderer with a face like a day-old pizza become such a cult hero around the world? Hmm? Well. To answer that, let us start with a little history. Who exactly is Freddy Krueger? Well, he's a homicidal maniac who hangs out in a world of dreams and slices you into ribbons if you happen to fall asleep. Okay, that's the easy part. But how did he get that way, and what the heck is his problem? Time to do a little homework. Freddy Krueger's mother was Amanda Krueger, a nurse who lived in the town of Springwood. On Christmas Eve, Amanda was accidentally locked in the hospital's mental ward, where she was attacked by a gang of a hundred raving maniacs, one of whom, probably this guy, put her, shall we say, in the family way. Amanda went insane as well, but nevertheless gave birth to a chip off the old block, yes, Freddy Krueger himself. Holy shit. What is it? But if Freddy grew up enjoying the normal childhood diversions, and the usual camaraderie of his childhood playmates. Not exactly the way to produce a healthy, well-adjusted kid. Not what you'd call family values. Sure enough, within a few years, Freddie begins doing away with the local children. He gets caught, but he gets off on a legal technicality. So the parents of Spring would take the law into their own hands. They track him down as a mob. They set fire to the building he's hiding in. Hey, crew, are you staying awake for this? Yeah? Yeah, no problem. Thanks, guys. So, 
Freddy the murderer is burned to death, which explains the disgusting, slimy face of his. His bones are gathered up and they're stuck in the trunk of an old Chevy. But the problem is, he's not quite dead. He's a little dead, but he's not all the way dead. And that's where the trouble starts. This was Freddy's first appearance in the original Nightmare on Elm Street, released in 1984. The girl he's stalking is Tina Gray, whose mother was part of the mob that killed the real Freddy. Rather than get back at the parents, Freddy goes after their children. I think that's one of the things that makes him so scary. He preys on the innocent. He makes the young people pay for the sins of their parents. And besides, a pretty little thing like Tina is a real easy target. Almost. You see, that's the beauty of Freddy Krueger. He's evil, he's dangerous, but he can't touch you as long as you stay awake. It's a brilliant concept for a horror movie. And we owe it all to the writer and director of that first film, Wes Craven. We are a culture built up around the concepts of control and um, structure, rationalism. And dreams are just the opposite. We don't have control of them. We're dragged into them every night. It's, um, it's almost like um, if it were Jaws, it would be an ocean that we're forced to swim in for eight hours every day. A former professor of humanities, if you can believe it, Wes, by 1984, had made a name for himself as the writer and director of several bizarre but brilliant horror films like The Hills Have Eyes, Last House on the Left, and Swamp Thing. There was a series of uh, newspaper articles in the Los Angeles Times that I found fascinating. Uh, and I read them actually quite a while ago. It was like in 1978 or 79. Uh, and they involved young men who had severe nightmares that were so disturbing that they would mention them to their families. Uh, and the third case I thought was, was the perfect setup for a film. He had a, a severe nightmare. He was very disturbed by it. He told his family about it. They said, well, we all have nightmares from time to time. He said, no, no, this was very different. It was very real, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid to go back to sleep. And uh, stayed awake four days, five days. And finally, um, after almost a week awake, he uh, fell asleep. They looked in. They saw he was asleep. Everybody breathed a sigh of relief and went to bed. In the middle of the night, they heard screams thrashing around in his room. They ran in, and suddenly it was silent, and they got to him, and he was dead. What Wes achieved in that first film which other talented directors like Rennie Harlan, Jack Shoulder, and Chuck Russell picked up on later in the series, is that remarkable feeling of being inside a dream. The way the images float one into another without any rational logic, but with a sort of subconscious logic that we all recognize from our own dreams. Part of this, the filmmakers accomplish through lighting. Notice how bright and all American the real world of Springwood looks compared to the dark, shadowy world that Freddy dwells in. In the world of dreams, Anything goes. Anything can happen. And because of that, the directors, the designers, and the actors are all free to let their imaginations go. And then, of course, there's the special effects. Looking at all six of the Nightmare films is practically a textbook in state-of-the-art movie magic accomplished by the finest talents working in the business today. Some of the effects are as complicated as they look, requiring months of planning and thousands of dollars, while others are deceptively simple. One of my favorites is this scene from part one. Nancy is drifting off to sleep, and Freddy, just dying to make an entrance, seems to pass right through the wall. The wall is just a thin piece of cloth, and the face being pressed into it is, well, it's just a face being pressed into it. It took about 10 bucks to shoot that scene, and people still ask me how it was done. It's easy to forget that when the original film was released back in 1984, there was none of the hype that surrounded the subsequent releases. There weren't any big stars in the movie, and in fact, every major studio in Hollywood had passed on the script. Little by little, though, word of mouth spread. To a large degree, it was the heavy metal punk rockers who first discovered Freddy. 1984, you remember, was the tail end of the punk movement with its hard-edged music and nasty anti-establishment attitudes. Well, Freddy was mean-spirited and nasty, unapologetic and completely unsentimental. What the punkers saw him attacking was this leafy suburban world of Elm Street, USA, with Dick and Jane and its happy white bread faces. I think that uh, kids began to realize that if this was something that parents thought was abhorrent and it, was, uh, it, it had that sort of sardonic wit to it, that it was something that they could embrace as, uh, as younger generations often do to the chagrin of the older generations. Here's another unusual thing about the Nightmare series that you might not have noticed. Each of the six movies ends with Freddy meeting his match, getting killed, at least temporarily. And in every case, it's a woman who kills him. Heather Langenkamp, 
was the first. Nancy taps strength in her that I think all kids know they have, especially for a girl who might not be willing to like exert herself or be aggressive enough or be assertive enough. It was really fun for any, any woman, any actress will tell you that it's fun to be able to play somebody who, who isn't like just along for the ride or you know, who isn't just watching the action from the sidelines. And there's very few parts like that. It's too bad. But I think there's another reason why the ladies fare so well against Freddie. There's one thing that he hates more than anything else in the world. It's beauty. He was tormented as a child and hideously disfigured as an adult. And it's that overpowering resentment and envy that finally does him in. With the boys, he's very careful. With the girls, he makes mistakes. <laughs> Now, what do you say we take a quick tour of the Freddy Museum, hmm? Ah, yes. My favorite. What would Freddy be without his trusty glove, hmm? Be like, uh, Clint without his magnum or Groucho without his cigar. Still pretty effective, but, uh, not as much fun. A couple of questions people ask me about the glove. First of all, where did it come from? Answer, Freddy made it. It's the very first thing you see in the opening credits of Nightmare on Elm Street, part one. Second, why did he choose a glove? Well, my guess, though it's never fully been explained, is that his hand was badly burned in the fire that killed him. And he had to build a new one to perform some basic tasks, like eating and killing people. In the course of six films, he, uh, he gets rather accomplished at it. How are you gonna fight me without your weapon, Freddy? You know, Freddy's made a splash, or maybe a splatter, all around the world. And it's fascinating to see how he plays in different countries. In Spain and Italy, for instance, they're very into the blood and gore aspect, and their advertising kind of plays that up. In England and Belgium, they go more for the science fiction fantasy element, kind of an intellectual Twilight Zone approach. In Japan, and this I find the strangest, they portray Freddy as almost cute, like he's this elfish little sprite who just happens to hack people to death. Here in America, Freddy's turned up in a lot of different forms. And these, well, these are some of my favorites. You got your Freddy dolls. Hi, I'm Freddy. <laughs> Freddy cards, Freddy bubblegum, Freddy pencil erasers, Freddy t-shirts, Freddy posters, Freddy comic books, Freddy paperbacks, Freddy coffee table books, Freddy masks, Freddy albums, Freddy keychains, Freddy buttons, Freddy makeup kits, and of course, the Freddy glove. Don't worry, Mom, the blades are made of plastic. About three years ago, I was traveling in Russia, and I saw at a kiosk in the middle of St. Petersburg a Freddy Krueger pill dispenser. So you can see, the merchandising of Freddy is worldwide. Hey, England! Is uh, really something that, that's hey! fair. I'm talking to you, you little punk! Why don't you shut up your damn mouth for once? Fred? Five hundred million bucks worldwide, huh? When's the last time I saw a check? Did I get one lousy ruble for that pill dispenser? D didn't, didn't, didn't you die or something? Oh, you'd like that, wouldn't you, you little twerp? Mr. Big Shot Actor, Mr. House in the Hills, and let's do drinks at Spago. You know where you'd be without me? Dinner theater, infomercials, selling thigh masters on late night cable. No! <laughs> Huh? What the? Ooh. What a horrible dream. Hey, guys, you still awake? Yeah? Yeah, no problem. You know, uh, maybe I should talk a little bit about Freddy himself. You know, give, uh, give some credit where, uh, where credit is due, huh? I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I do. Movie monsters come and go. Special effects are fun. Merchandising helps, but... There's something else about the character of Freddy that people have really latched onto. There's a special quality to him that keeps bringing audiences back. 
People ask me what that quality is. I have a simple answer. He's bad. Really bad. Does Freddy have a good side? No. Does Freddy, underneath all that hate and violence, really have a heart of gold? Uh-uh. With Freddy, what you see is what you get. His job is killing people, and he loves his work. You see, Freddy isn't some maniac who breaks into your house and chases stupid teenagers around with a machete and a hockey mask. No. No, Freddy lives in your dreams, in your mind. He knows all your secrets, everything you like, everything you hate, everything you're scared of. If you've got any weaknesses at all, Freddy knows about it, and he grabs it. It's the ultimate violation. Case in point, Debbie from Nightmare 4. Nice girl, but she has a terrible fear of insects. Now, if you were a sadistic killer with a demented sense of humor, how would you bump her off? Swarm of bees, maybe? Hmm? Bury her up to her neck and uh, send in the carpenter ants? Not bad, but uh, Freddy. Our Freddy does it one better. <laughs> Greta, a beautiful young lady with dreams of being a model. Like many models, though, she has to be so careful about not gaining weight that she's become a borderline anorexic. Freddy takes care of that. Bon appetit! Don't talk with your mouth full, dear. You are what you eat. Gross? Yeah. Sick? Maybe. Huh? But you see, there's something about the sheer joy and creativity he brings to the task of killing someone that's hard to ignore. It becomes a game that the audience can play along with. What new, horrible, sick, demented way can Freddy come up with to knock off another kid? You know, when... When people ask me about Freddy and, and the movies, I always think back to summer camp, sitting around the campfire with that uh, one counselor who could scare the hell out of everyone with a, an incredibly scary ghost story. The Nightmare on Elm Street movies, I think, have become a kind of collective American campfire that teenagers, young and old, go to every summer to scream, and tremble, bury their heads on someone else's shoulder. So how do we eulogize Freddy Krueger? He was a bad man. He was an evil man. He had no redeeming qualities whatsoever. He was ugly, he was rude, he was disgusting. Boy, I sure hope somebody gives me a send-off like this. Hey, somebody else give it a try. Do me a favor, Freddy. Stay sharp. We'll see you. When I watch you, Freddy, um, I feel young again. I feel like a kid screaming in my closet, afraid of you, and you take me back there every time. Having seen your last film where you died, I would uh, like to say to you, come on back, all's forgiven. Um, I think we can kick a little bit more butt in the world, so don't stay away forever. Do you get the feeling that maybe this guy isn't dead after all, hmm? How about it, Fred? He isn't saying. I will say this, though. If you've been staying awake since 1984, do yourself a favor. Go to sleep already. And you guys on the crew? What do you know? Every last one of them. Now the fun really starts. <laughs>
Chucky's back. And he's a living dog.